Hello, I'm Peter Nerksey from Sun Microsystems, and some of you I've seen coming to these talks for five years. You know, that's, it's been five years now that we've been holding these Bay Area Computer History Perspectives talks and with the Computer Museum now since the arrival of the Computer Museum from Boston. I remember right now what I'm thinking of is our last talk at the end of March, which was so cold, it was freezing. That was, we thought end of March would be a reasonable time to have a talk here in an unheated area, but this year hasn't been a usual year. And then thinking further back, a talk that comes to mind is ILIAC-4. We had a talk on ILIAC-4 here at NASA. And I remember in particular how we were all amazed that ILIAC-4 consumed 250,000 watts, just ILIAC-4 itself, and another 250,000 watts to try and cool it. <laughs> so now here we have. Sage, which consumed one million watts that puts ILIAC-4 in its place. Yeah. And I think, yeah, one million watts, and that was just for one computer, and there were two computers in each Sage Center, and there were 22 Sage Centers around the country. So you can figure how many megawatts were going into Sage, just out of the domestic electrical production. And this is really special because we have the speakers talking right in front of pieces of Sage, as I said, a huge computer, there's only small pieces of it here. And when we project the video, the screen isn't quite big enough, so parts of the video will be projected onto <laughs> Sage itself. <laughs> so Sage is really here this evening. So we'll start with the video, which is the classic Air Force film of the era. And then Paul Edwards will speak, as I checked uh, before we began, Paul was age one in 1958 when SAGE was first implemented, that Paul has observations on SAGE. And this is example history. You know, we, each generation comes back and looks at history. And in computer history, we're already at the stage where we have a second or a third generation coming back and looking at events and what happened. And then we have two veterans of the era, Les Ernest, who will be talking on hardware, and Jim Wong, who will be talking on software. So you really have the overall picture of SAGE. I'll mention our next program is scheduled, scheduled at this time for June 16th at Xerox Park on the Star computer. And it'll feature a working Xerox Star. And we are able to present a working Xerox Star because Dave Kerbo of Sun Microsystems has 12 stars in his home, <laughs> which he cannibalizes in order to get one running from time to time. He thinks he can get one running one last time for this last talk. So that's uh, June 16th, Xerox Park. OK, so perhaps now we can start with the video. One of the most dangerous threats to our nation's security is the possibility of attack by high-speed enemy bombers armed with nuclear weapons. These bombers can strike at supersonic speeds from many directions and altitudes to confuse our defense and delay the dispatch of interceptor weapons. In a mass raid, high-speed bombers could be in on us before we could determine their tracks and then it would be too late to act. We cannot afford to take that chance. It is to meet this threat 
that the Air Force has been developing SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment System, a network of geographical defense sectors covering the continental United States and extending into Canada. Each sector has as its focal point a computer installation known as a direction center. A group of sectors comprise a NORAD division, where the key point is a computer installation called a combat center. Combat centers are headquarters for higher echelons of command, integrating the individual sectors into a centralized defense system. Let's suppose an enemy launched a surprise attack with high-speed aircraft intent on destroying our great city. Long-range radars, which constantly scan the skies, detect all planes in flight. The information is flashed electronically to the direction center, where the computer instantaneously makes the necessary calculations and displays its findings as tracks on the scopes at the consoles. In the air surveillance section, tracking operators monitor all traffic in the sector and quickly relay unidentified tracks to operators in the identification section who determine that the tracks are hostile. An alarm sounds in the weapons direction section. The senior director and senior weapons director size up the threat using all the up-to-the-minute information displayed before them on the scope. On the basis of this information, constantly supplied by the computer, the track is assigned to a weapons director who decides that interceptor aircraft should be sent against the enemy. Immediately, the weapons director assigns the control of the intercept to an intercept director, whose situation display shows him that fighter craft have been scrambled. The situation display also indicates that the interceptors are assigned to track A-137. I indicates interceptor aircraft. G, that tracking is good. One, the number of the controlling weapons director. Two, the number of the intercept director. A vector symbol indicates the heading of the fighters as they fly toward the point at which interception will take place. RL-15 is the intercept flight code number. Thus, the intercept director has the information he needs to direct his portion of the air battle and the battle begins. At 28,000 feet, the bombers speed toward their targets. But jet interceptors roar to the attack, guided by electronic impulses received directly from the computer, supervised by the intercept director miles away. Now comes the test. Were the calculations correct? Were our judgments right? With weapons rushing toward each other faster than the speed of sound, the slightest error can mean failure, and bombers free to strike with nuclear bombs. The console display shows the intercept weapons approaching, and the battle is joined. The fighters lock on target, and rockets are fired. is over. The enemy destroyed. But one important task yet remains for the computer, to guide the interceptors safely back to their bases. The SAGE system provides us, on the North American continent, the finest possible air defense against attack by manned bombers. The number one threat of today, and quite a few tomorrows. OK, uh, I, I'm Paul Edwards. I don't know if anybody can compete with what we just saw, so <laughs> please. <laughs>
forgive me if I'm not quite as brilliant as that. Uh, as Peter pointed out earlier, I was far too young to have worked on this project or even to have seen much of it in action. And uh, so as not to embarrass myself, I'm going to speak as quickly as I can and leave the uh, details of the participant action to those who were there, Les and uh, James. Part of what I want to do is, Les and James are going to talk about the hardware and the software of SAGE, and I will leave out many of the technical details and talk about the political context in which SAGE uh, came into being, which was, of course, the early part of the Cold War. Can those of you in the back read this? Good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, SAGE actually began in 1944, before the war was over, as the Airplane Stability and Control Analyzer, which was an analog computer designed to uh, serve as a, a, pro, a controller for a flight simulator. Flight simulators in this period were basically little boxes that you could get into whose attitude would change with a, you'd work them with a stick and it would simulate an airplane in that sense. The idea of the airplane stability and control analyzer was to build a general purpose flight simulator that could be programmed with the characteristics of any airplane for the purposes of training pilots or perhaps for designing the aircraft itself. So you could see how it would respond to the controls. The project was handed by the Navy Special Devices Center to the MIT Servo Mechanisms Laboratory. Jay Forrester, who was then an advanced graduate student, he had joined, come to MIT in 1940 and joined the Servo Mechanisms Lab, uh, took on this project as the leader. He spent about a year trying to make this analog computer work for this purpose. And it's important to realize, I think, that uh, in this period, it was not obvious that there was a better way to do it than that. Uh, digital computers were, of course, under development, but nobody really knew that they could be made to work, to work reliably, to do the kinds of things that Forrester wanted them to do. And Forrester's main problem with the analog techniques was not that they were uh, inaccurate, though they were, of course, as, as you all know, analog computers have inherently limited accuracy. His main problem was that they were slow because they were electromechanical in those days. They were ball and disc or uh, motor, motor drive analog machines. And for a flight simulator, you need a real-time controller because the thing you, what you're testing is the response of the aircraft to the controls. This meant that the computer had to work with what was then extreme speed. Um, He gradually came to believe that it would be better to go with a digital technique. And around 1946, he switched to that technique after hearing about the ENIAC and other projects. Then he faced a different set of problems. One of the worst of these was the unreliability of vacuum tubes. They were expensive and they burned out a lot. So as the uh, computer ran, it would constantly be burning out tubes. It was this meant that they had to be found and replaced, caused lots of downtime. But um, Forrester was able to solve that problem eventually by redesigning the tubes. He actually made some major contributions to that problem. The computer for the flight simulator had some unique features, the main ones being that it was designed for real-time operation and for control computing. Virtually all other digital computer projects, projects at that time were calculators. They were going to be used for science, for sort of offline calculation of complicated mathematical problems. Forrester's goal was much more linked with what he the, the machine that he was actually trying to control. So to achieve speed, control, and reliability meant that the, this project cost a lot of money. The final total spent on the Whirlwind computer, which was the digital version of the ASCA, uh, was about $5 million in 1950s dollars. Now, that today would be about uh, 20, 40, who knows, some uh, much higher number. Other computer projects of this period were typically $100,000 to $500,000. 
So Whirlwind was 10 times as expensive as even the most expensive of most of the other projects around. Here's Forrester. Uh, one of the inventions that he made for the SAGE project was core memory, uh, actually co-invented at the same time, around the same time by somebody from RCA, but uh, this is him with a core memory plane, and I'm sure the others will talk later about the cores that are in these boxes you see up here. Next. Well, remember that up through 1948, the idea of Whirlwind was that it was going to be a controller for a flight simulator. The Office of Naval Research, which was paying for this project, was rapidly losing interest because they were spending millions of dollars a year for what they were now starting to see was really only another general purpose digital computer project. At that time, there were already 13 other digital computer projects, also very expensive, being funded by various agencies. And the question was, why should we pay for this one? In, for the 1949 fiscal year, MIT requested $1.5 million for the Whirlwind project. That would have amounted to something like 80% of the ONR uh, mathematics program budget and about 20% of the total amount that the ONR was spending on all contract research put together. The actual budget was $1.2 million for that year, so there was a really huge investment in this project. But it was made very clear to Forrester that if he did not produce results in the form of a working simulator controller very soon, uh, he was going to lose his sponsor. So in 48-49, Forrester began to cast about for new sponsors and therefore for new justifications for the project, since flight simulator, so what? He was in a good position to do this because during the immediate period after the war, he had already been looking at all kinds of applications for his machine, not just military ones, but also uh, things like insurance calculations. But he had uh, gone quite into quite some depth in thinking about how digital computers could be used for fire control. That's the problem of controlling guns. Uh, he had thought about a digital computer is the centerpiece of a combat information center, the sort of telecom center on a ship. Uh, and he had written a couple of long reports about digital computers as controllers for uh, air defense systems in naval and anti-submarine warfare. By 1948, he had done so much of this thinking that the Whirlwind Group was able to develop a plan, a 15-year plan for digital computers and military operations. They projected it would cost $2 billion to carry out this program, and that digital computers would be applied to air traffic control, missile guidance, logistics, uh, fire control, and especially important here, real-time computerized command and control. This was an enormous vision, much bigger than what most people were thinking about for digital computers at this period. Well, Forrester was lucky. He had this set of justifications more or less pre-prepared. He still needed a sponsor. And right around the time when Whirlwind was about to be killed, the proposal was to uh, cut its budget to about 10% of what it had been for the uh, 1950 fiscal year, the Soviet Union set off its first atomic bomb in 1949. Now, here's where the context gets very interesting. The Air Force, before and during World War II, thought about air defense as not what we think of today, that is defending against an incoming attack, but as destroying the sources of enemy fire. That's defending yourself against an air attack. Well, that could mean destroying them before they leave the ground. The, in fact, the initial use of this term was in the context of anti, uh, uh, using airplanes to attack ships at sea because they would be shelling the land and you would send an airplane out to destroy them. Up to 1949, there were no Soviet nuclear weapons. There had been a campaign for a better radar-based continental air defense in 1948, but it had failed. And the only air defense program that had been approved was a very, very minimal uh, lash-up system, it was called, that was going to have something like 85 radar stations to cover the entire 
United States. Then the Soviet atomic bomb was exploded, and immediately this posture of very little air defense became a serious public relations problem for the Air Force. Civilians began to demand an active air defense, uh, particularly those who lived in Washington State around the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, <laughs> Boeing, and so on. They were not that far from the Soviet Union, and they could see the problem. Well. At this point, what began to happen was that immense amounts of money began to flow into the Air Force and the rest of the services uh, to meet this problem. And they tried all kinds of things. They speeded up construction on the lash-up radar system. One of my favorite little stories from this period is they, something called the Ground Observer Corps. This was a volunteer program begun in about this period, which consisted of setting up observation platforms, mostly along the northern border of the US and up into Canada. And the Air Force had a radio ad campaign that asked people to volunteer to serve their country uh, to defend against incoming bombers. So it sent these people up into the, onto the platforms where they would watch the sky with binoculars. And they saw lots of things. <laughs> 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 they saw airplanes. Many of them were civilian. They saw birds. They saw all kinds of things, and most of them they thought were Soviet bombers. I mean, this was a scary <laughs> period. They would then telephone the nearest air base, which would then have to figure out if this information was worth anything. And pretty much none of it was worth anything. So it very rapidly became obvious that despite the huge size of this program, there were 8,000 observation posts, and at the peak of the program, 305,000 volunteers staffing these things 24 hours a day. Uh, the information was pretty much useless. So commanders just ignored it. I mean, for one thing, by the time it had been verified, the bombers would already be there. So what was the point? The reason I'm telling you this story is that the purpose of this program was not really air defense. It was public relations. It was saying to the public, something. we are doing something about this problem. We see it. At the same time, the Air Force started looking everywhere for ideas from scientists and engineers. And now we're restarting. And I'm not sure what's going on. Here we go. Next. Well, there was another factor here, and that was that the strategic doctrine of the uh, 15 years or so following World War II was basically this. The best defense is a good offense. And this goes back again to that pre-war period when the idea of air defense was to attack the source of enemy fire at the earliest possible point. The US has a huge perimeter. Protecting the whole thing seemed like an impossible task. It would be easier and better to get there first. And that, in fact, was the strategy. It was known as prompt use. This was basically a doctrine of preemptive strike. The idea was we would be watching with every means at our disposal for movements of aircraft uh, that looked like they might be mobilizing for a strike. And if it got far enough, we would simply bomb them before they got off the ground. For this reason, the Air Force did not actually expect to need a continental air defense. There was no point in it. Um, this strategy was adopted for a number of reasons. I mean, one of them was that there were very few nuclear weapons in this period. It took uh, more than a decade for significant numbers of them to be assembled, so that uh, using them at all meant that you had to uh, get, use them before they were, might be destroyed here. There's another reason for this, a strategic reason, which is the problem of air defense. The perimeter is huge. The issue of fi even finding the enemy bombers at all, when they might be flying under your radar or whatever, was hard. How do you maintain coordination of a defense effort that's the, on that scale? There was the issue of whether you could shoot them down. The best kill ratios historically recorded in air warfare were during the Battle of Britain when about 10% of attacking planes were shot down. That worked in the Battle of Britain. It was one. But it wouldn't work in nuclear war, because even half a dozen airplanes getting through is still a catastrophe. 
Finally, there's the problem, as we all re probably remember from the Cold War, of hair triggers. That is, preventing false alerts and the launch of an attack in a situation which is not actually warranted. Next. So, a guy named George Valley, another MIT professor, was assigned basically to this task by the Air Force, and he heard about the whirlwind. He decided to adopt it for radar calculations in a large scale, uh, sort of high tech air defense system. He met Forrester, he saw these various reports that Forrester had already prepared for other military applications of computers, and he was impressed. He ended up rescuing the whirlwind and using it as the basis for SAGE. The plan for SAGE was developed at MIT during some summer studies in 1951-52. It was called something else then. It was actually called the Lincoln Transition System for a while. I think the name SAGE came in 1954. Um, I don't want, I'm taking more time than I wanted to, so I'm going to skip over this quickly, but it's interesting to notice that there was, in fact, an analog control alternative that went on for some years. Uh, the idea was simply to automate manual calculations to some degree with calculating aids and pretty much use the old system. Next. So the project that we just saw the movie about was SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment. It was a radar-based early warning system that used centralized networked computer control. SAGE was deployed between 1958 and 1961. There were actually, I think, 23 sectors. And the original vacuum tube computers, the last one was finally taken down in 1983, still operating. The total cost of the system is hard to calculate, but it's somewhere between four and $12 billion in dollars of around 1960, which would be about five times that much today. So really quite a bit of money. The Sage Direction Centers, which you saw briefly during the film, were four-story concrete blockhouses. They had their own power plants, partly because the power grid might go down in the event of a war, but mainly because the machines took so much power. They had an entire floor devoted to air conditioning. <laughs> the one, one floor was devoted to the two duplexed computers. Uh, we've already heard these statistics of the enormous size of the machine. One effect of Sage was the enormous contract that IBM got for building the SAGE computers. Was, they, they received about $500 million during this period to build the 56 computers. It was the single largest contract IBM had in the 1950s. Uh, this is unfortunately a little hard to see, but this is a block diagram of the, the SAGE Direction Center. This up here, the top four is the control center. I think the uh, this floor is the, control, the computers, and down here is air conditioning, and off here to the side is the power plant and its cooling towers. Here's an interior of a SAGE control room. We'll skip through these quickly since we already... The, the monitors gave off a blue light, and they were sometimes called blue rooms because of this strange glow that they emitted. SAGE was responsible for many, many technical advances, perhaps more than any other single computer project. Magnetic core memory, I already mentioned. Uh, Forrester's highly improved vacuum tubes, which were much more reliable than those that existed before. The uh, oper operationalizing of duplexing, linking the two computers together so that they would share data and one could go down and the other one would continue. The total downtime of SAGE computers was somewhere between one and 10 hours a year. This is in a period when most computers were down for numbers of weeks or even months, all told. SAGE was responsible in part for digital data transmission over phone lines, for solving all kinds of problems in analog digital conversion, the use of modems. Uh, it was in a certain sense a network all the uh, direction centers were linked and shared data about their, their immediate situation so that the, the overlap problem could be solved. Uh, video displays, you, as you saw in the film, graphic display techniques, and maybe most important, real-time digital control. Again, not a use most people thought of in this period. 
He was also responsible for the first algebraic computer language, the first real-time software. The programs written for SAGE were enormous by the standards of that day and even by today's standards. The first operational program in 1958 was about a quarter of a million lines of code, the most complex system ever built. And one of the interesting problems faced by the SAGE designers was how to organize people to write such a program. By the early 1960s, in, Sa in some of the uh, spin-offs from SAGE, these systems were up to a million lines of code. Uh, James will talk about the Systems Development Corporation, I assume, but this was the, uh, a spin-off of the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica that did the programming for the SAGE system. At its peak, this effort had 800 programmers, which doesn't sound like a lot by today's standards, but at that time, by some estimates, this was about 20% of all the programmers in the world. <laughs> it was the largest programming effort of the 1950s, and it was extremely influential. Many people left SDC or other uh, SAGE programming efforts and went on to found their own companies and spread knowledge. This is the cover of the IBM manual for the SAGE computer. Well, I'm going to close by talking a little bit about SAGE as a Cold War product and a Cold War social project. The issue of air defense for which SAGE was developed gave the project a sense of urgency that it would not otherwise have had. Uh, that meant, in turn meant that there was almost unlimited funding available for this. And uh, it, it, we could wonder what would have happened had that uh, Soviet atomic bomb never gone off. The problem it was trying to solve, the problem of nuclear command and control, was an extremely difficult problem. As the Cold War dragged on and it became obvious that this meant basically 24 hour, 365 day a year, permanent alert, the rationale for using a computer to do this control became more and more telling. Uh, these machines had to be extremely reliable. I mean, being down for even an hour is a problem in a situation like that. Uh, nuclear command systems must be centralized because of the issue of uh, renegades, people taking off with their own weapons. And finally, of course, the machines must operate in real time. Let's go on to the next one. It's an interesting project to look at because one might think that the agency behind this effort was the Air Force. In fact, it was not. It was the group of scientists and engineers, many of them from MIT and RAND, who really pushed this project through. There was actually a great deal of resistance, especially at the higher levels of the Air Force, to SAGE for many reasons. The most fundamental reason was the strategic issue I, I mentioned before. Since the Air Force did not expect to need SAGE, it was hard for them to really back it. Um, what happened was a process of mutual orientation in which the civilian engineers educated the Air Force about the potential of these new machines. And in turn, the military funders directed the engineers toward this particular solution to that problem. SAGE was extremely successful, at least in this sense, that by the time it was over, the Air Force had been completely transformed from a group that initially resisted computerization to the leading advocate of computerization within the military. SAGE has a lot of legacies. Many of them are technical, and we'll hear about those more in a minute. One of them was uh, more computer con control systems for the military. There were something like 25 other computerized command and control systems being built in the late 50s and 60s as soon as the SAGE systems became uh, operational. One of them is a strategic air command control system, the worldwide military command and control system. And in fact, if you look at the Strategic Defense Initiative of 1983, it's really just SAGE all over again with a different set of weapons. There are also some ironies about SAGE. It was almost obsolete by the time it was completed because ICBMs made its uh, warning, time, warning abilities superfluous. It probably would not have worked. It was easily jammed. 
Uh, many of the tests of the system were fudged to make it uh, appear that it would work, but it probably wouldn't have. And the Air Force, as I said initially, didn't want it. But SAGE did work in many other ways. It built, worked to build the computer industry. It worked to justify air defense. It trans transformed the Air Force into a high technology force. And maybe socially most important, it created what became a very long standing belief that there was a technological solution to the problem of nuclear war. I'll stop there. Drink of water first, right? My name is James Wong, and uh, I'm going to try and uh, tell a story about my life with uh, Sage. And I want to first thank uh, Dag for inviting me uh, to speak uh, about Sage here. Uh, in the last three or four weeks, uh, uh, being a thinking about SAGE and trying to get a memory dump, uh, it's like going home, really, back uh, to SAGE. Uh, and fortunately, um, if I knew I was going to be standing here today, 20 years ago, I would not have cleaned out my attic and <laughs> threw all those documents away. <laughs> you know, uh, what's so much for, you know, so, you know, so much for being a pack rat, right? I did save them for 20 years, though, right? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, by this time, you know that uh, Lincoln Lab was the birthplace of SAGE. And uh, Lincoln Lab was chartered to be an R&D organization, so they consented to start the software development if some other organization would pick it up and do the development and later on installation at all the sites. Uh, the Air Force looked around to find somebody, and the only logical choice was the RAND Corporation, because RAND had a lock on the <coughs> programmers in the country. RAND had about 10% of the programmers, and that was 25 experienced programmers. <laughs> so the industry, industry experts said at that time there were like 200 experienced programmers. So we were the logical choice. So this was 1955, and I was very fortunate to be one of uh, eight people as the nucleus to go back to Lincoln Lab to work with them. And the objective was to pick up the programming function uh, transfer it from Lincoln to the Rand Corporation, and then move it out here to the West Coast in Santa Monica. So that was the key. Uh, the original commitment f uh, were 25 programmers, uh, and the, the agreement with Lincoln Lab was we would be working together as one organization, and the Rand programmers would be integrated into the uh, Lincoln organization. And here we were back in the East Coast, full of vim and vigor, young, idealistic, ready to conquer the world. And, uh, and remember, at that time, the chill of the Cold War was on. So there was a lot of anxiety at that time. And, uh, and here we were, back East, out of environment, actually, because we're all from the West Coast. And in our motivation, really, what was our motivation? I guess we had quite a few. Uh, first one was uh, we're going to protect the country. Second one was we're going to be doing something that nobody has ever done be before. And let's see, a third uh, you know, thing was 
uh, we want to prove the skeptics wrong, those who said this was a mission impossible. And that was our, that, that's, that's our motivation for going into this thing. Now, I remember the first time I walked into the computer room at Lincoln Lab. And this is what I encountered. And it, it's awesome. You know, rack, you know, this cabinets upon cabinets of uh, vacuum tubes. And I think uh, Paul mentioned uh, uh, these, you know, that was, uh, what is it? Something like uh, 58,000 vacuum tubes, something like that. And it's mind-boggling. How can so many vacuum tubes be working without some sort of failure? You know, it's really mind-boggling. Anyway, and then we were told that, hey, this is only a simplex machine here in, in this lab. Out on site, you're going to have a duplex computer. So you can imagine. And you walk around the cabinets, you know, you just feel like you're engulfed, uh, you know, in there. And you get a strange feeling that you're part of the computer and the computer's part of you, you know. It's like a member of the family. It's sort of weird when you get right down to it. Well, from there, my first assignment, since I had an electronics background, was uh, to work with the uh, equipment team to check out the long-range radars, the gap fillers, uh, the ground-to-air data link, and the height finders. And my specific assignment was to write a test program to check out the ground-to-air data link. And two uh, Val Labs employees were assigned with me to work on this program. And at that time, everybody really worked hard. Everybody, Lincoln Lab personnel, as well as their, uh, RAN, and there were Burroughs people involved, IBM, and RCA. There were many, many organizations involved. So it wasn't just a, a few uh, companies involved in this thing. Well, uh, we worked about three, about three weeks and finally, we got the program uh, written, got it key punched, and we were ready to assemble the program and make a run. Well, um, in those days, computer time was real tight. So if you want to do a attended run, you have to run from midnight to dawn. And if you want an unattended run, you can submit your runs, and they'll run it for you during the daytime. Since uh, the Bow Labs people and I decided, you know, we had like a, a pride of authorship in this uh, computer program, we wanted to see it assembled and run, you know, firsthand. So we scheduled time at midnight. Uh, we all agreed that we would show up 10 minutes early so that uh, in case something goes wrong, we still can get our time in. And uh, at the appointed day, uh, about five minutes to, to 12, I would come running into the computer room, uh, you know, with my deck of cards, and I decided to play a little joke on my friends. So I'd come running in the computer room and pretend I tripped and, wow, <laughs> all the cards were all on the computer floor, right? You should have seen my associates. They were down on the floor trying to reassemble the deck. You know, of course, they couldn't do it because, you know, we, even, even though our deck was sequenced, some of it, we had made changes to an inserted cards in between, you know. So in those days, you know, we had one card per, you know, uh, instruction, and you had the ops code and the address, and that's what it was. And after scrambling around for a while, uh, I went back to the back of the cabinet and brought out a duplicate deck. You should have seen the faces on those guys. <laughs> I almost got killed for that one. <laughs> so everybody worked hard, but everybody, there were a lot of practical jokes going around too. So, uh, uh, so it made the things a lighter and, and just eased the tension some. But those were the days, they were really heady days. Uh, schedules were tight, and uh, everybody worked day and night. And we were not getting compensated either at that time for the for working uh, over overtime hours. Okay, my my next assignment. Uh, once again, I was very fortunate to be involved in this one. Uh, I was assigned to what was called the program executive control, the most important program in the Sage uh, system. 
That today's uh, language, that would be called the uh, operating system. And the operating system, uh, PEC it's called, uh, was designed with a radar sweep, a 15 seconds radar sweep in mind. And the computer it was called one frame of data. And the, the executive was uh, broken down into three subframes. So you have five uh, seconds each subframe. And program modules would operate in the first subframe, a set, different set of program modules can operate on the second subframe, and third subframe have a different set of modules. So Lincoln Lab was very ingenious in many of their designs and their concepts. And this is one of them, this uh, program executive control. A second one is uh, the COM pool. As the name implies, it's a common pool of data that program modules would use. They would either put data into a particular location. Later on, another program might use that information. So the COM pool uh, was another innovation. As a matter of fact, COBOL, the COBOL COM pool was based upon uh, the SAGE uh, system. And a an, an third innovation was, uh, uh, was called PTRS, uh, Program Test and Recording System. Everything run in the SAGE program was recorded on tape. And the tape can be later uh, dumped uh, for analysis. Uh, at that time period, uh, the biggest problem we had, since this system was a huge system, first time uh, put together, the requirement specifications were vague and uh, incomplete. At that time, you know, if you don't, we all know this, if you don't nail down requirements, <laughs> if you have three programmers, you're going to have three different interpretations, right? So that's the problem we faced. And uh, the specifications call in those days, I remember Dave, let's see, it was uh, op specs and math specs. Those were the requirement specifications. Uh, and on top of that, they were classified, you know, secret or confidential, so it was difficult to get to in the first place. <laughs> so, and anyway, um, the, so the priority at that time, before you can start writing coding specs and writing code, was to get the op specs and math specs uh, tightened up so that everybody is on the same page. So that's, that was one of the biggest problems involved. That means schedules were you know, slipping. It's an interesting thing because all the programmers are sitting in one room trying to re get these specs together. And we look at each other and says, who's doing the work back, back at the office? You know, there's nobody back in the office doing anything. Well, anyway, from there, uh, Putting the programs together, of course, uh, many, many, many program modules, as I remember, something like 90 to 100 program modules that takes care of the radar input, the identification functions, uh, the uh, weapons assignment function, and um, you know the switch over from computer to computer. Uh, there are about 90 to 100 uh, modules, software modules. Okay, from, uh, from there, uh, this is now getting into, uh, let's see, 1957. This is 1957. Did I get the dates right? Yeah. Uh, okay, it was time now. Uh, the program were being checked, and it was ready to move the program to McGuire to check out the McGuire uh, Sage site. And I was uh, one of the team leaders to lead the team out there. And the interesting question that came up at that time was, can we test and integrate new hardware, new software, and new procedures at the same time? <laughs> so nobody had an answer. So what I call the massive manning concept was applied. <laughs> so we had 
70 programmers out on site. And everybody, you know, they, people were working day and night and uh, constantly because computer time was uh, in, in short, short supply. Because other organizations were using computers as well. IBM, you know, like I said, Burroughs and RCA and other organizations using computer time also. Well, okay, getting out on site now. Uh, we anticipated problems, of course. And every time a problem showed up, our programmers would say, hardware. <laughs> hardware people would say, software. <laughs> so there were a lot of finger pointing going on because there were a lot of problems. <laughs> but, you know, fortunately, at that time, IBM had a very liberal awards uh, policy awards program for their engineers. Uh, if the engineers can come up with a fix for uh, a problem in the hardware, uh, depending on the complexity of the problem, they would get awards. The nominal awards are, are like $50 and $100, and it went up to like uh, $1,000 to $15,000. Uh, I remember as soon as that $15 prize was awarded to somebody, those engineers came over to us and said, would you help us isolate this problem and, and you know, and develop a fix for us and we'll share the awards with you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so there was still finger pointing, but they were friendly you know, finger pointing from then on. <laughs> now this is getting to be the uh, latter part of uh, 57 now. And uh, there were some changes going on back at uh, uh, RAN headquarters. Uh, the uh, System Development Division of RAN, who was re uh, responsible for the uh, SAGE, had grown so big that it was like the tail wagging the dog. And RAN had the same kind of problem that uh, Lincoln had. And RAN was chartered also to, be, to do long range research. And so they didn't want to do, you know, the, the the uh, production and installation. So they spun off the new organization called System Development Corporation. So one day I was working for RAN, the next day I was working for SDC. So that's the way it was. Also at the same time, uh, toward the end of uh, 57, the uh, Sage computer came to Santa Monica. That would be now the test bed for development and maintenance of future uh, software. And I was fortunate enough to take the team uh, back also from Lincoln back to uh, 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 Santa Monica and had checked out the computer. And from that point on, the official handover of the uh, software function from Lincoln to RAN was complete. Okay, now we're back, we're going up to 19, uh, okay, 1958 now. Uh, and uh, June of 1958, uh, McGuire went online. And that's uh, just about two years after the equipment arrived on site at the blockhouse over there. Now, Stewart Air Force Base was the next SAGE site to go online, and that went on in September of the same year, 58. And they needed only 40 programmers to do the installation. Now, subsequent sites, <laughs> subsequent sites uh, went online every two, about every two months until 1961 when all the SAGE sites were, uh, were completed. And for those sites, they needed only 15 programmers. So we went from 70 to 40 to 15. I guess in all, uh, I think Paul mentioned uh, there were like 20 sites. Uh, I think we had a count of like 20 uh, direction center sites, four combat center sites, uh, one combination uh, direction center and combat site. And that, as a matter of fact, uh, that was in, up in North Bay, Canada. And that's the computer. That's the combination combat and direction center site. As a matter of fact, I have a friend back here, Dave Burley. He was at the uh, uh, 
at North Bay, uh, Ontario. And I'll bet you he can still find his uh, uh, finger marks on some of those knobs. <laughs> well, anyway, um, Paul mentioned that SDC had really uh, launched uh, programmers into the computer industry, and it's very true. At the height of uh, uh, SDC must have trained over 2,000 uh, programmers. Uh, Paul mentioned also that we had like uh, 400 programmers at any one time. That's about right, uh, in right ballpark. Half of it was at home uh, doing the modifications. The other half was on site supporting the installations. And of course, uh, by that time, the other half was in industry. Uh, which is uh, about a, another 800. And uh, many of them, like, like Paul said, started their own companies, became managers of uh, data processing organizations. And uh, uh, they really cut their eye teeth on the stage, all these, all these programmers, all these managers. Well, the, uh, the word around the uh, industry was, it was first done in SAGE. And uh, that, for many, many years, those were the, just the, the, the words said in the industry. Now, um, RAN, I'm sorry, uh, SAGE was the uh, real-time command and control computer-based system uh, with, uh, with capability so advanced that 40 years later, today, some of that capability can still be called state of the art. You know, the computers today, what? They're a lot faster and uh, better. But, you know, you think about things like uh, multiprocessing, real time database management, uh, distributed processing, uh, time sharing, interactive displays, uh, networking. They were all there in SAGE. That concludes my talk. Thank you. Oh, okay. Can I just say one more thing? Uh, Dave Burley, my friend, found this in his files. So if anybody wants to come up and take a look at it, it's the data flow in the computer system. So if anyone wants to come up and take a look at it, uh, they're welcome to. And I'm sure Dave can answer a lot of the questions. <laughs> uh, Dave is also uh, generously, he's going to con contribute this to the museum. I got to get you a pen, Jim. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yes. How does anything else like this leak into industry, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all heard about the other world, and all that information was leaked out to the industry. <laughs> in your talk, you discussed the fact that we start off and we've had loose specifications, yeah. and you had the hardware people pointing at the software people, the software people pointing at the hardware people. I'm glad to see that in 40 years, nothing's <laughs> changed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I uh, sat down this afternoon to write up some of the war stories just to focus. Uh, I uh, called this sage a marvelous technological solution to the wrong problem. Uh, there, there, there are many more war stories than, I, than we can have time for this evening, but uh, let me go over a bit of it. Uh, I um, admired the MIT computer work from afar uh, initially. When I got out of Caltech at, in uh, 1953, I um, knew that I would have to go into the military in some way because they had tried to draft me already. Uh, I found that I was qualif uniquely qualified for a special program in the Navy. Um, I had a, an engineering degree and poor eyesight. If I had been lacking either of those, I couldn't have qualified. But uh, this. Uh, <laughs> This somehow got me into the Aeronautical Computer Laboratory in Johnsville, Pennsylvania, 
where we had the world's largest and fastest computer of, of that era. It was called Typhoon. It was a, an electronic analog machine built by RCA. And it needed uh, check solutions. So my responsibility as digital computer project officer was to do, generate check solutions on an IBM CPC, an electromechanical computer uh, It was a real bear to, uh, to get anything to work on. It only had 40 words of storage, uh, uh, <laughs> which was uh, incidentally electromechanical, and you had to give it exercise in the morning to get the oil flowing or it wouldn't work. <laughs> but anyway, this, um, while, while there, I began to hear about this Navy-supported project at MIT uh, that was a, that it produced whirlwind, and um, what would happen was the admirals would go to MIT, uh, would listen to what they were told by Forrester and others, took careful notes, but they didn't quite understand what this was all about. So then they would come to our lab and would talk to my boss, Commander Blau, ask him what this means. He would then at lunchtime come to talk to me and ask me. <laughs> I would give it back to him, he would give it back to the admirals. <laughs> and uh, over, over time, I began to, you know, it was really uh, whiz-bang stuff. I was uh, intrigued by all of this. So when it came time to escape from the Navy, I uh, applied to several places. I was offered a couple of jobs at IBM, but I, I chose to go to MIT Lincoln Lab and somehow ended up in the weapons integration group. Uh, which was responsible for making manned interceptors and missiles uh, fly under um, SAGE control. Uh, we had to develop the, uh, the equations for guidance and uh, we designed the intercept director's console and that sort of thing. Um, it was all great fun. Uh, since James uh, mentioned that he w did uh, uh, the data link, uh, initially, Commands to the interceptors were sent by voice radio. You'd tell, uh, tell them which direction and how fast and at what altitude to fly. Uh, this data link, of course, automated that so the computer could give the directions uh, on a little display in the cockpit. And uh, uh, the specs for that were all very carefully worked out to sh show how many bits for each function and the identification code and all of that. Uh, I sort of expected you to mention a small problem that arose. There was one contra contractor that built the transmitter system and another that built the receiver. <laughs> and whereas they all agreed about how many bits for what, they didn't agree on, they, there was no spec on which was sent first, the higher order bit or the lower order bit. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure enough, Murphy's Law got them. And, uh, so they got to redesign uh, one of the systems. I forget which one. Um, uh, one of our early uh, tasks was to uh, bring the Bomark missile into the uh, into Sage control, and um, now the Bomark was a, um, a rocket-assisted takeoff. It took off vertically, uh, would get up to speed, then would be powered by a ramjet, would hill over, fly at high altitude with a Doppler radar looking down, presumably when you told it where to, when to look, it would find a bomber down below and it would dive and uh, kill it. Uh, that was in theory. <laughs> uh, well, it, it was a pretty complicated beast and of course uh, it was necessary to test the electronics of the, uh, of the missile uh, when it's sitting on the ground. So they had uh, a, a test mode for the, um, for the um, missile complex in which you throw switch to test and then you can um, send simulated firing commands to the various missiles and you, you check whether they received them and understood and all that. But of course it, it doesn't cause the missile to fire, it just uh, is testing the electronics. Well, when we were asked to review this, one of, the, one of our engineers looked very carefully at this system and discovered that if you send the missiles, the uh, test, test commands, and then throw the switch from test to operate without individually resetting each missile, 
they will all erect and fire. <laughs> um, as soon as we mentioned this to Boeing, they quickly concocted a fix for that. Uh, a year, year or so later, I somehow was selected to lead, lead the team that uh, obtained nuclear warhead certification for the Beaumont missile. So we had to go through all the hardware and software and prove that the probability of um, failure, combination failure of any of any anything would uh, produce a um, an inadvertent launching. Uh, with probability less than 10 to the minus very large number uh, on any given day, and that it would take at least two berserk people to do it um, by themselves. That is, one person couldn't, couldn't uh, do a launch. Well, we were able to convince ourselves that uh, uh, eventually that, that, that it was okay, but along the way we discovered a, a rather frightening uh, <laughs> thing about uh, the way it worked, there was the, all the telephone lines from the computer out to the launch sites were duplexed for reliability. So if one goes down, uh, you have another way of issuing the launch commands. Uh, all of SAGE was built that way with, with backup and redundancy. So at the far end of the line, there's a little black box that listens to the primary line, and if it it senses that that has gone bad, it automatically switches to the backup. Uh, unfortunately, we discovered that if the backup is also bad, what it does is amplifies the noise and generates a random bit stream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, one, of our, uh, one of our guys did a Markov analysis to figure out how long it would take to get a firing command. <laughs> It turned out to be a little over two minutes. <laughs> um, um, but, however, in order for the missile to actually launch, it has to get a full set of commands, that is direction, speed, uh, altitude, as in addition to the firing command. And we were able to show, and, and had to get this within a certain length of time, we were able to show that the probability of getting all of that stuff within the required time frame was very, very small, very, very unlikely. Therefore, the effect of this would be the missile would erect and then abort. Um, I, I published a, an analysis of this uh, with the provocative title, Inadvertent Erection of the IM-99A. <laughs> and as luck would have it, Two weeks after we released the report, it happened <laughs> in suburban Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, so I somehow uh, promptly found myself to be uh, the head of a committee to fix that. And it was very, very easy. You just sense bad, bad line number two, and then you shut down. <laughs> so um, this was all... Uh, um, heady stuff, and um, we were able to, to make the hardware work pretty well. But of course, when you, when you backed off and looked at um, the performance specs or the lack thereof, uh, you, you realized that this was, in fact, a gigantic boondoggle because there were no performance specs in the sense of uh, an air defense system, you know, that function. There were, were there were no, literally no 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 requirements of being able to meet a man bomber threat of any sort. Uh, Paul mentioned the jamming that that would kill the system in an instant. It, it simply could not track bombers uh, that were uh, dropping chaff and actively jamming. Um, there were later some some hacks at trying to make it work in that kind of an environment. But they were just that, and, and a much simpler system could have been used in that kind of environment. Um, if that weren't enough, however, there were certain other things that contributed, would have contributed to its downfall in a real war. It was basically a peacetime defense system. It worked fine <laughs> in, in peacetime. Um, but uh, the um, 
MIT had recommended from the beginning that these uh, big computer facilities be buried underground so that they would be reasonably well protected. Uh, the bean counters in the Pentagon, though, saw that that was a big expense to put this stuff underground, so they said, well, let's just put it in a concrete blockhouse. Okay, well, it then becomes a lot more vulnerable. But the killer uh, on all of this was that the Air Defense Command uh, wanted to wanted a good lifestyle, and they, had, they, they knew that their officers would have to spend a lot of time in these facilities. They looked around at where there are good facilities. At that time, uh, General LeMay of the Strategic Air Command had the best of everything. He had the best officers, clubs, you know, every, everything was top notch for SAC. Uh, so they ch put most of these computer facilities or a large fraction of them at SAC bases where they all became bonus targets. <laughs> 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 Obviously, if there was a man bomber attack, they'd go for the SAC bases first, and they'd get the air defense system as a byproduct. <laughs> so it, uh, it was not a, not a wonderful air defense system. Uh, in the same era, the uh, Air Force Intelligence was producing uh, claims that the uh, Soviet Union was um, was developing an air defense system of a similar sort, but somehow it never materialized. I don't know whether that was because they really weren't up to it or wh whether they uh, really understood better than we did <laughs> uh, uh, what, what it would take. Um, then, but then there was this wonderful facility in, in SAGE, the, the display room with glimmering blue consoles and subdued light and it became a showcase for both uh, the brass and all the military and also congressmen. And everyone decided that, you know, this is the way to run a war. <laughs> <laughs> so then this gave rise to this whole industry of uh, L systems, so-called um, 438L, 465L, all, all the stuff that were uh, competing for funds with, um, uh, with other things, and for the most part, uh, none of them worked worth a damn. Uh, there were a few exceptions. The satellite um, control system, I would say, was very effective and uh, you know, provided good intelligence. But most of these others, uh, including the Strategic Defense Initiative, were basically boondoggles, and we ain't through it yet. I mean, this stuff is still going on. It gave rise to a a, a multi-billion dollar industry that basically produces useless junk. Uh, and here we are 40 years later, still at it. Talking about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it's still doing it. The government's still doing it. <laughs> anyway, once over dimly. Thanks. Be recorded. Uh, uh, basically, that that was it. Assembly language. Uh, later on, uh, late, uh, they tried to put Jovio, try Jovio as the language. Everybody knows about Jovio. It's a higher higher level language, but. Uh, it was ter it was not cost effective and it was never never put in. It might be mentioned that this was a, a fairly peculiar computer in in some ways. It was uh, schizophrenic. It had a split accumulator uh, that was thought of as being uh, x y coordinates for geographic th things, and indeed it worked quite well on that sort of thing. Turns out, though, most of the computation was not of that nature, and therefore this structure, the architecture, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, 
I guess what I, I didn't mention that this was, uh, uh, let's see, a 32-bit machine. Uh, the left half was the ops code, and the right half was the address. So that was basically it. Uh, that's right. Yes, uh, it's 60. It's 69k actually. There was, uh, there was. Uh, they added on, and the, that box right there, I believe, is only 32k. There was two boxes, and there's, they added another 4k later on. So it was 69k. Uh, actually, this system is really a drum system. There's 12 drums. If you go back there, you can see them back there. There's a few back there now. Uh, the capacity was. 150k words. Can you imagine? Today it's what gigabytes, <laughs> but in those days that was really something. What was the cycle time? Cycle time. Uh, let's see. I six six microseconds. Six. Okay. Well, yes. Uh, Miter, the spinoff from MIT did get into the uh, FAA system development business about five years after SAGE went operational um, and uh, produced some of the kludges that are now breaking down, I guess. Uh, in addition to this, uh, IBM was the prime contractor for, their, for the uh, FAA. I just wanted to mention one other very important spinoff of SAGE was the Sabre airline reservation system. The SAGE stands for semi-automatic ground environment. SABRE stood originally for semi-automatic business research environment. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, the Source code. The question is how the source code was was stored. Oh, uh, the program uh, was actually on a uh, mag, mag tape. All the co and, and the and the mag tape when you start it up is read into the computer, and it's uh, sh stored on drum, except for the executive and a few of the programs that you need uh, that would be on core in core. That's basically the and, and yes. Different versions. Oh. Versions of the software. Well, okay, that, that is called the modification, right? And design change control is a, was a huge problem in those days. Of course, you know, software programs are never finished. It goes on and on and on and on. And yes, what happens is if there's a a fix that had to be made on site. The site programmer, programmers would make the fix, but they were not allowed to mess with the, the, the uh, master tape that came from, the, from home, home base. But they could actually run their changes and then submit the change back to home base so they can integrate it into the whole system. And that, that's a continuing process, and if, if it's not a emergency fix, uh, if they would accumulate a whole bunch of fixes and they would uh, then produce a new mod of the software and that would go out to the sites. And that was typically many months between, as I recall. Yes, that's true. I guess uh, you're saying, uh, how do we view uh, uh, the... Uh right, if you think that by the time you worked on stage, if you think that by the time this is actually deployed in all the 22 centers and it's really working, okay. it'll right. be incredibly obsolete, right. it'll be much better stuff, or if you think this will be state-of-the-art for a long time, or... You have to remember, we were young and innocent, <laughs> and <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We were, we were really flying by the seat of our pants. And uh, 
we were just working to get the system working, and we didn't. We, there was not enough time to, you know, think ahead to see what uh, what would happen in a few years. That was basically it. Yeah. Um, I um, came into uh, Lincoln Lab in, in a somewhat different mode than most of their employees. I actually knew how to program. I think I may have been the only person they ever hired who who knew that, uh, and. Uh, I, my office mate initially was a specialist in radar data. Uh, he called it radar data, being from Boston. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I asked him, I, you know, I'd been an aviation electronics officer for three years, and I knew a little bit about electronic countermeasures. So I asked him, well, what do you do if they jam? And he said, well, <laughs> we shut down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew, you know, this was my first week on the job. I knew from that point on that this was a fake. A and uh, somehow I stuck with it for five years or so before I wandered off. And, uh, but it was, um, it was a, a somewhat um, disillusioning experience, I would say. We, we didn't have transistors uh, initially, uh, and there's, they certainly weren't suitable for all of the uh, um, applications. For, for example, the, the, the core memory, uh, you needed uh, big, humongous drivers to, to uh, run the core. The tubes were it at, at that, in that era. Later, the, the, the beefiness came along. I, I think that figure probably comes from the fact that there was going to be a second generation Sage computer that was transistorized and one system was built and installed but at that point it became very expensive and they abandoned it. As I remarked, I, th I think that was really in intelligence propaganda. Uh, that is, the Air Force, as you know, the, the, the services intelligence agencies uh, often perform to, to meet their, uh, the objectives of the organization. And uh, I, I, it might be mentioned also that in another sense, SAGE was really the Air Force's response to Nike. Uh, with another air defense system being developed by the Army, the Air Force figured they had to outdo them, and they, they succeeded in that Nike eventually was integrated into SAGE. <laughs> that is, SAGE became the dominant uh, partner, even though it didn't work. That, that's an interesting question, and, and Les's response is right on. There were there were a lot of contests within the military about who should handle air defense, and it was, again, this issue of, you know, what is this problem? Are we waiting till they get here and then shooting them down, or are we trying to do something further out before they actually reach U.S. soil? So the Army response was, air defense is like artillery. <laughs> we shoot them as they come in. And uh, there were systems like this built for NATO, and several other NATO countries adopted similar systems. I don't know very much about the Russian air defense system, but my impression of it from the only source I found on that subject was that it was extremely decentralized, which is a very interesting contrast. I mean, here in the U.S., we end up, you know, we have a decentralized society, you know, an extremely centralized air defense system. The Soviet Union has one of the most centralized governments in the world and ends up with the most decentralized air defense system in which basically everybody shoots at whatever is coming in when they see it. <laughs> we didn't have any tools you know it was just uh, uh, running your program and see if it runs if it doesn't run you go back to uh, and uh, sit at your desk and do it again well yeah it halts or uh, you know you get the wrong answer like that type of thing as a matter of fact I have I have a good story to tell you about that one uh, 
working with uh, programmers uh, back way back in RAN, I learned a lesson. Any time a programmer tells you, this program is going to run 100% this time, bet him a dollar. You're going to win every time. <laughs> Uh, the development was done on what was called the XD1. Uh, that was the prototype of the Sage Pro, uh, the Q7 out on site. There were actually two two development centers. One was at Lincoln Lab with the XD1, and the other one was at Kingston. No, yeah, Kingston, the XD2. So we used both those sites for development. The XD1 was a simplex system, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. And that is, there was it was not duplex. That's right. Uh, the story I heard was that they had a Polaroid camera mounted in front of the console, and if the system crashed, they would take a picture of the lights of, on the console and give it back. <laughs> you're, you're right, 100% correct. That was one of the things. That's a matter of fact. It was mostly software. There, were, of course, had to be a digital link connecting the Nike site to the Sage site, but um, that was, you know, f minor compared with the software that had to be done to hand over targets to them and and uh, l lay it on them. Did this system have the ability to launch without human intervention, or was it always? No, no, always required. Two levels. Oh, uh, the question was, was the system able to launch automatically, that is, without human intervention? No. Um, the uh, uh, the um, weapons director had to designate the target, hand it to a, an intercept director who would then launch uh, a missile or an inter man interceptor to get it. That was, however, uh, contemplated by the designers. And was Sage ever integrated with Sage? Was BMUs ever in integrated with Sage? Yes, I think. Yeah, the, 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 the information flow, yeah. yes. It was not a not a automatic. <laughs> Again? Yeah, the radar data came in from the dew line, actually, uh, into the, the, count, the, the direction centers located in the northern part of the US. Uh, the information, radar data, actually came in from the dew line. What sort of data rates for these landmarks, uh, for the code lines? Uh, I, I don't have a clear recollection. first test, it kind of told the plane to make like a 90 degree turn, and from then on, the pilots would never turn that on again. <laughs> uh, I don't recall hearing the story in just that form. Um, there, the initial, excuse me, the question, uh, uh, the, he heard that uh, the computer told the uh, pilot to t do a 90 degree turn instantly, uh, and he, they realized they couldn't do it. Um, well, it is true that the guidance, the initial versions of the guidance program did not take into account uh, the turning radius of the interceptors. Now, uh, you, they, w they would, uh, of course, servo into about the right direction over time, but uh, there was an improved version of the software that developed that took into account the maximum, uh, minimum turning radius of the interceptor to get it into position. If you're planning to make a, a broadside attack, which is one of the uh, kind where you want to come in at, at an angle off the beam of the bomber, uh, you have to come to a certain position, do a turn, and, and then come in. And um, that obviously cannot be done um, on a dime. So this improved version that took into account the turning radius uh, did a better job.
Oh, yes. Well, well you, what do you mean, fly it? No. Uh, well, the, the 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 switchover I think was generally under. Uh, sorry, the question is how how do how is the switchover made in, if one machine goes down? Is that uh, that was done uh, generally not automatically. It was done manually. It was initiated manually. Uh, uh, mean time between failure. Oh boy, I I have no recollection. Um, Probably d days, a couple of days, probably, I, I would guess. And they did preventive maintenance on all of these tubes, of course, um, and uh, would run margins on them to find those that are getting close to failure. Uh, I remember at a certain point, they uh, were, were running these margins on a tube and discovered that uh, it was absolutely dead, but the diagnostics hadn't discovered it. They traced the circuits back and discovered that during the redesign process, this had been cut out of everything. <laughs> so it didn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, Paul mentioned a little bit about the reliability of the system. Uh, the way it works is the duplex uh, computer, if one fails, the other one would cover. And if both fails, the other sites would expand their coverage. To, to cover the, the site that not, not covered. So with that in mind, the system itso itself, the figures I heard was a 98% reliability for the system. That was totally unheard of in those days. It was parallel, I, w I believe, yeah. Right. And, um, and basically, uh, it, it taught IBM how to make um, core memory, which uh, led, led them quite a long way ahead of their competition. It's been so long, I'm afraid I have no recollection. Yeah, peak. They're, they're all there. There were no games as such played on it, but uh, it turned out that SDC also had a contract with the Air Force to, to uh, produce simulated exercises. So they did have training uh, for the uh, uh, op operation of the system. And a actually, it was on the way to one of those simulation exercises that Alan Newell and Herbert Simon had their first conversation about building a chess computer. There, there was a certain amount of uh, horsing around, of course, in the programming classes. Uh, I remember uh, one, uh, one fellow in my class uh, who went on to fame um, produced a uh, line drawing, a vector drawing of a Soviet bomber that flew across the screen. Unfortunately, he f neglected to deal with the, what happens after it flies off the edge of the screen. The, the display space was sort of toroidal and uh, the bomber w broke up and various pieces would drift across in, in, very, in different orientations. Uh, I, for me, I, uh, I chose uh, as an exercise to turn on all the alarms in the command center 
Uh, there were f about 50 of them, I think. Uh, however, although the computer can turn them on, it can't turn them off. <laughs> <laughs> so that was caused a bit of consternation. And I believe I, I, I heard um, on the net on the internet that uh, somebody developed a uh, playmate display in which you could use a light gun to remove articles of clothing, something like that. I believe that was invented by somebody uh, associated with Whirlwind. It was in use in, on the Cape Cod system, which is the precursor. Oh, sorry. Question: Who who invented the the light pen? Uh, and I'm not sure. It it was pervasive in MIT. It showed up on all the machines there, and uh, I'm not really sure who did the first one. Yeah, they did run exercises frequently uh, and carefully programmed them so that the system wouldn't break down. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that the answer to your? <laughs> how, how, the question is how effective was the system? You, you mean in a in a peacetime defense system? As a yeah, it worked fine as a peacetime defense system. Right. Yes. However, right. Yeah, that that uh, that uh, argument has been advanced that we we bluffed the Russians into not attacking. We we probably could have done it for a lot less by using paper mache <laughs> <laughs> right. was the choice of a light gun as opposed to a light pen did that have to do with like the amount of electronics that had to go into it or was it sort of a military way of looking at it? <laughs> the, the question was the choice of the light gun uh, uh, a military decision or a technological one. It 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 was technological. It took uh, a, a, at that time a rather complicated uh, photo sensor that uh, I don't think would fit in a light pen. Initially, uh, just a few years later, they developed light pens that were very much f smaller. As a matter of fact, I used one on TX2 to develop a um, cursive writing recognizer. Uh, in 1961, and it worked quite well. Have you exhausted the supply? Yeah. All right, also. One last round of applause for Dag Spicer of the museum who organized it all. Yeah. 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 Yeah.